Mr. Mark Selby, how are you, sir? Very good, Mr. Matthew Gordon. Good. Well, um, thanks for joining us. Very, very early uh, your time. Um, we great to see you at uh, PDAC over in Toronto, your your hometown, um, and get to get to meet lots of people over there. Um, I mean, how, what did you think of it at the end? Did you get much out of it? I know it, it was good. Um, you know, to be honest, uh, well, one, it was there was a there was a bunch of the battery supply chain in town, so got to caught it, catch up with with several of those groups and had some very good meetings. And then secondly, you know, I think that the you know um, the amount of government around, both you know provincial, federal, and, and different you know uh, mines ministers, I got to participate in a couple of events. <laughs> and there was, I know from other people, you know, there were a number of, of other various roundtables and so forth with with different government ministers. I think I met with uh, across the conference, you know, um, six different federal and provincial ministers at one point or another. So it's good. Nice, good, 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 good. good. Hey, well, look, um, we better get on with it with Nickel, okay? So, um, you know, people weren't quite sure what was happening last year. We've been kind of following the um, Nickel price and movement and drivers. So what's this week's update? Sure. So um, we talked, last time we talked was the uh, Beat Up the Analyst show. Um, and, um, you know, since that time, um, Nickel's broken through 18,000 all the way up to 18,500. So we're actually 16% higher than a month ago when, you know, Nickel was going to be horrible forever. You know, we've given up some of those gains. Um, yeah, you know, again, this was even a, a little ahead of what where I thought we would be. Um, but we're still, you know, up over eighteen thousand dollars a ton or eight dollars and twenty cents a pound, which again, ten years ago we would have been doing all the happy dance if if this is where nickel prices troughed. This is what's happened. So uh, you know, again, don't uh <laughs> you know uh, don't believe what you read in the news. Um you know, one of the big drivers, obviously, was uh, we talked about this going into the, you know, what I said was going to be one of the drivers for seeing this bounce after Chinese New Year. We were at a record long net short position. So that's, again, people betting that the nickel price is going to go down further. That peaked out at about 24,000 lots and there's six tons of, of nickel in each lot. So that's 150,000 tons nickel short. Uh, at the end of January, in just over a month, um, that's already collapsed back down to eight thousand net short. We're still net short, so you know, again, you know, there's there's still, um, you know, we're not back to people being net long. So again, you know, there, there's still some positioning uh, that that could help um, push push prices further. But you know, again, sitting sitting quite nicely, and again, a little ahead of where I thought we would be, you know, uh, three or four weeks after a Chinese New Year. Um, you know the the other big driver of it obviously was the thing that we all had, had also talked about was the the battery restocking in 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 the market you know again what made 2023 so bad was the price of lithium collapsing and and everybody destocking inventories in the battery supply chain lithium prices have bottomed nickel prices bottomed and again you're going to see people start to restock and and that's definitely happened we've seen uh, nickel sulfate prices in china have gone up 3% um, in just one week, again, not going to see that, you know, uh, continue uh, on a straight line. But, you know, uh, again, very clearly the restocking is is underway. Uh, stainless prices started off the year pretty good. Um, and we, we gave up a little bit um, in the last few weeks and a little bit of inventories piling up. So maybe a little ahead of itself in the, in the Chinese market. Um, what's interesting is, you know, you're seeing, you know, different markets respond in different ways. You know, the, the key thing is, you know, scrap discounts, um, you know, which are always a good good indicator of the um, you know the health of, of specific markets bottomed last summer at quite low levels you know and they've basically rebounded you know um, um, fairly strongly and and you know are the narrowest they've been in a while so that that's a decent sign that they you know the markets are improving uh, in the in, in in the US uh, in Europe right and um, the, and the other thing that people um, look to um, is EV sales as an indicator of what the future could look like I, again you know in January, Nickel was going to suck forever. You know, EV, the EV thing was all done. Again, all of these quote experts talking about uh, EV sales. And uh, yeah, so um, Bro Motion, who tracks uh, EV sales, just came out with their uh, February numbers. And yeah, no, it uh, did suck. We're up uh, 32% uh, year over year in, in February. Uh, and yeah, it sucked in the US and Canada. Oh, no, wait a minute. It's up 33% in the US, Canada, 34% China. 21 percent in europe so uh again these are way ahead of of where most analysts have that going in terms of of factoring this stuff into their final metals demand so you know 
uh, again, in, in in very decent shape uh, on that front. Right. Okay. And and just more, I guess more broadly at the, at the moment, you know, this kind of green transition, this EV um, revolution, this net zero in- initiatives, and so forth. I mean, that, that's not going the way of ESG and sort of quietly being shoved into the back cupboard. Industry is invested, it's front loaded, and that's still obviously head, heading the right way. How um, how's, how do you, mining companies actually benefit from that? I mean, you've talked about some of the government grants available to you, tax incentives, et cetera, but is, do you expect to see more of that this year? Is that going to start flowing upstream? Oh, for sure. I think, you know, the, 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 the only good thing to come out of this, you know, total misforecast of, of the nickel market is that it has basically, there was a, a U.S. conference yesterday where, uh, again, you know, highlighting the national security risks around having China driving the bus on key commodities like nickel, cobalt, and, and other parts uh, of the battery supply chain. So, you know, I think... If anything, you know, the, this noise is just basically, you know, increase the government resolve to to do whatever they can in terms of financing the government, U.S. government's floating the idea of rebuilding the strategic stockpile of nickel that they used to have back in the, in the uh, you know, in the Cold War. And so, uh, it, you know, for, for us, it's a net win. And, and again, I think, you know, 2024, I think, you know, 2023, there's been, there was a lot of talk about governments writing checks. I think 2024 is where, where you're going to actually start to see some checks, you know, actually being written. And then, you know, once that money starts to flow and people see, oh, okay, you know, you, you know, you as a mining company will have a, a large portion of the equity you need to build a project coming from various government sources. Um, so I, as an equity investor, don't need to be, don't need to worry about the equity dilution. Um, you know, if, if you go to uh, raise money for your project. So, um, Again, I think the, the the thematic is just getting stronger and stronger, and there's more government global support to basically find ways to get China out of the supply chain, um, for sure. Right, and well, and and with China comes Indonesia, comes the Philippines as well. So um, I think I mentioned to me, you know, this week by another CEO, not not in the nickel space, but certainly interested in the nickel space and what's happening with it with with the, with the battery thematic. So obviously with Indonesia in the mix, it's going to be quite hard for nickel companies to actually find a, a space in the market. It's going to find it's going to find it hard to um, be able to compete with Indonesia if Indonesia are going to uh, manage and, and maybe even affect, control, whatever, manipulate, whatever words you want to use, nickel price going forward. So what, what, what can you tell us about? What's going on in Indonesia? Maybe what we should be looking at? Yeah. So, so the other big driver of the price move so far this year, you know, in addition to the battery restocking that we've seen, is Indonesian supply. So, you know, in our investor deck, you know, last eighteen months, you know, very explicit. You know, I, for five years, I've been saying we are going to see an ONEC um, emerge with Indonesia, and then the, the last eighteen months or so, talking about having, you know, Indonesia manage or supply. I thought it would still be a few years before they started to actively do that, but it looks like they've already started to do it. So, um, you know, we're seeing stories that, you know, or supply has been limited, that they're not necessarily increasing. They're rolling over people's quotas for, for ore production, but they haven't increased them at all. And again, to give you some idea of what the sentiment in, in Indonesia is like, there was a editorial in the past week in the Jakarta Post, which closed with, uh, and I quote, the idea to establish an OPEC style organization for nickel was once introduced by President Jokowi, an investment um, an investment minister whose name I won't pronounce. Um, such an organization could help producing countries better coordinate supply and prices. Perhaps it, perhaps it is a good time to carry on with the plan. They control, you know, again, they, they have mo- Indonesia on its own controls more of the nickel market than OPEC did at its peak. And so... The, the, the plus there, another minister talked about, you know, wanting to keep prices at $18,000 a ton. Uh, you know, again, that would be, that's where we are now. That would be pretty tricky to do, but I'm sure they'd be quite happy to see prices float 10 or 15% higher with, with the stick that, oh, you know, maybe we'll push them back down all the way down to $18,000 a ton. The thing people I think miss is 
Indonesian nickel production is not necessarily operating cost, very low cost. You know, you're talking anywhere from, you know, ten to fifteen thousand dollars a ton, depending on cobalt prices, depending on, on on some you know key input prices for coal. And so there are operations like like our, our project where, yeah, it has a bigger upfront capex, which the government is going to you know write me a big check um, to help see get in production. But then I have forty years of very very low cost, you know, production um, going forward. You know, well below, <laughs> you know, these kinds of, of prices we're talking in the in the four to five thousand uh, dollar a ton range. And so it's it's a great place to be if if you have a dominant supplier who's you know sort of you know x thousand dollars a ton ahead of you on the cost curve. Who's determined to manage prices up above, you know, what their costs are, and so I, again, I, I don't understand. I'm going to pick on BHP again. It's you know the issue for BHP in Western Australia is they have a bunch of third and fourth quartile uh, operations, which again are higher cost than those Indonesian operations that are been a lot of them been around for thirty or forty years or more, um, and, and the, their plans for new supply are more projects in probably what is the highest cost jurisdiction in the world in Western Australia. So. Again, don't extrapolate BHP to the entire industry. You know, there there are assets like the ones we have in Canada. You know, that can be set up to be you know multi decade you know multi decade significant free cash flow machines. Um, you know, and again, the government's going to help us. You know, with the equity check. You know, to get them built. So, um, you know, that the, you know the, again, that's the part that I think kind of got lost in in the shuffle of all the the bad news over the last six weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look, maybe we'll come back to some some of the these other kind of factors which kind of drive the economics, which um, drive price, et cetera, on, a, on another call. But let's let's jump to company news. Um, Widgie Nickel, they've been on before. We've talked about them. Yeah, they, they're they in, again, in, in, in Western Australia. Um, they had picked up um, some assets just southwest of, of Cambalda. Um, some pretty splashy uh, intervals, um, excuse me, as they're drilling. But the nice thing is, you know, some of these are open pit mines, you know, that are open pitable, um, shallow ramp access um, deposits. Um, you know, net net, they've come up with a, you know, a nickel production of about 5 million tons at one and a half percent nickel. Again, I've said this many times, you know, again, you get a very splashy interval, but it's tough to put a mineable width around it, you know, and, and have that grade sustained. So, uh, again, not surprised to see you know a one and a half percent average nickel grade come out of those operations. They published a scoping study last week. I haven't delved into the the specifics too much, but you know they're talking about producing ten thousand tons of nickel for about six years. With you know you know they've got a, a bunch of additional resource um, initial capex two hundred sixty nine million NPV of four hundred million at a twenty four thousand dollar nickel price and pretty healthy twenty two percent IRR and cash cost is just over. Five dollars a pound. That's not an all-in sustaining. That's just on a on a C one basis. Need to dig into the numbers a little bit, and again, encourage you to do it. You know, I would look at you know at production costs from Western areas. I mean, they were a much deeper operation, but you know, uh, look at Nova Bollinger or uh, Mincor to look at the operating costs there, and, and, and use that as a benchmark to see you know sort of what these guys are projecting in terms of operating costs to see if they're in the ballpark uh, of reasonableness. Um, the other news, um, you know, uh, premium nickel in uh, Botswana, um, some nice intervals. So they're, you know, sort of starting to po- poke their way outside of the resource and look at extending, you know, what's there. Uh, the one hole was 180 meters um, down plunge um, from the resource. Um, and again, 18 meters of a 2% nickel equivalent. So there's actually more copper in this, uh, more copper that, than the nickel um, in, in some of those holes. And they reported another one that was 400 meters down plunge. Um, that was, you know, had intersected some massive sulfide. So again, numbers key, key here is, is, is just going to be to see, you know, again, we put a mineable width around it, um, you know, in the jurisdiction that they're in, you know, w- you know what that's going to look like from an operating cost. Again, would remind people that there's a lot of mines in, 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 in Australia that are operating that had much higher historic rates, you know, that are currently shut down. So, you know, we'll, we'll see, you know, where the economics for this asset come out, but, but we'll see what happens. Um, the other news um, came out of Korea, um, Queensland Pacific Metals. They've got a um, a direct, direct nickel uh, process plant, which is another um, uh, way to leach nickel other than high pressure uh, sulfuric acid. Um, they've announced a three year delay in terms of what they had uh, were going to do to supply POSCO and LGES. Uh, originally talked about end of 2023, now end of 2026. 
um, is what was reported in Korea, um, you know, based on comments uh, from the CEO. Again, you know, leaching projects outside of of uh, China and Indonesia have been challenging. Uh, you know, the world's best at it. Um, the only ones actually that's been really successful in building two pressure acid leach plants successfully is Sumitomo Metal Mining, uh, and they just invested a uh, big uh, bulk tonnage ultramafic with FPX nickel uh, out in British Columbia. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with uh, QPM as they, they move along here. Yeah, I think we, we saw them last in April. I seem quite confident at the time. Obviously, something hasn't quite worked out for them. Maybe we'll get back in contact. Um, Mike, brilliant. A uh, little romp, romp through there. appreciate your um, thoughts on um, price influencers and uh, house affecting companies. We'll see you next week. Sounds good, sir. Thanks.